Let us pray. By the power of your Spirit, O Lord, make your word become a joy to us and the delight of our hearts. Amen. Our first lesson this morning comes to us from the Gospel according to Mark. In chapter 7, we'll hear verses 1 through 8, then 14 through 15, then wrapping up with 21 through 25. Let us listen now as Christ taught us to listen with ears to hear. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honors, uh, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as, as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile. But the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, and folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson this morning comes to us uh, from the letter of James. We're going to read in the first chapter of James, uh, beginning at verse 17 and reading through verse 27. Hear the word of the Lord. Every generous act of giving, with every perfect gift, is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creation. You must understand this, my beloved ones. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and, on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for the orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. This is the word of the Lord. Make no bones about it, James 
is hard on us. Hard because he leaves little room for negotiation, little room for us to have anything both ways, little room for us to rationalize or to disconnect between words and actions. The profession of faith And the actions of faith and ultimately simply believing in Jesus and actually living as a follower of Jesus Christ cannot be separated. Now for those hardcore Protestants among you who would seek to challenge the validity of the book of James as being too deeply entrenched in some sort of works theology that does not follow the faith alone principles of Protestantism, well, I say tough. It's in the Bible. You can't argue with it. It's there. You can't ignore it. Besides, the very first words of the text today place all the gifts we receive, including salvation, in the hands of our generous God who has given them to us. Thus, there is no sense of working to achieve salvation, but rather, James challenges us to act out what we profess to believe. He does not say, if you want to be beloved, then you must do this or that. No, no, no. But rather, James reminds us that because you are the beloved of God, you ought to do this or that. Now, despite the challenge of James calling us to difficult actions that are reflective of the life of Jesus uh, and that is intended for his followers, this is less the harsh kind of put up or shut up challenge, but more of a, if you love Jesus, please inform your face and your actions. So many times I see people, I believe in Jesus, but they have a frown on their face as though it's distasteful to them. I mean, if you love Jesus, it should show. You know, the old, the old thing, if, you, if you're happy and you know it, smile, okay? And yet James speaks to us here in a kind of truth that is sorely needed in our culture, certainly in our churches, and more importantly, in each of our own personal lives. It begins with the challenge of anger. James no doubt witnessed the same kinds of anger that we witness in our public debates today. And I'm guessing more than his share came in church gatherings. We have a problem in our world that is clearly not a new one. Too often we fail to listen to one another, but prefer to talk at each other or past each other We're simply attempting to subdue one another by speaking quicker, faster, louder, more shockingly, more obnoxiously than everyone else. That seems to be what we have devolved into. James would show us that this isn't new. Now, this is great if it is your intention to be sure that you hear nothing that might cause you to reconsider your position or to ensure that you and everyone else ramps up the levels of frustration and anger and hostility, but it does little good if you want to actually change someone else's understanding or viewpoint. This does not build up the community to speak with anger and frustration. It only seeks to destroy it. Whether we are acting out of ignorance, arrogance, fear, or pain, It does no good to anyone, save perhaps the stroking of our own ego. And this is actually more damaging to ourselves. As ego is easily understood as actually an acronym, E-G-O, edging God out. Because when we feed our egos in whatever way it is to lord ourselves over others, We are not building up the community, but we are indeed edging God out of the community, edging God out of our hearts, edging God out of the world, which we are supposed to be introducing God to. An action that usually leads to the utmost spiritual, emotional, and physical tragedies in the end. And so James bids us to listen first, then speak, if necessary, 
and be careful of our anger. In the days that James wrote his letter, the world, and particularly the Christian community, held in high regard the talent to speak eloquently and persuasively to people. Whether or not it was the truth doesn't matter, just to be able to speak eloquently and persuasively. I'm sure glad that we have set that foible behind us. Because of that, James calls the Christian community to focus more energy on actually listening. In particular, he desires that the church listen more carefully and more deliberately to the word of God, that is, to the scriptures that have been handed to us. We live in an age now where any and all craziness, uh, all of the craziest ideas are so readily disseminated far and wide. And you need not look any further than your own minds to realize how easily we are attracted to them. James knew this was true. And so he calls on us, as he calls on the whole of the church, to listen first and foremost to the word of God in order to discern the truth of everything else out there. I constantly meet people along the way with the most interesting ideas about how we should act in and around the church, how we should get to heaven, or indeed if heaven actually exists. All of them would contend that it comes from God, and yet so little of their argument is actually contained in Scripture. Without knowing the Scriptures, we will be led far from the truth. And thus I am reminded again of the wisdom of John Calvin, who wrote nearly 500 years ago in his Institutes of the Christian Religion these words, Those who abandon Scripture and imagine some other way to come to God are not so much deceived by error as they are excited by sheer craziness. And it's true. You have seen it. You have heard it. And I doubtless say that there have been time to time that you have espoused it. But let us not be fooled, friends. James does not ignore the ang that anger exists. It's there. He does not even say that we should never be angry. But rather, he does challenge us to set aside any human or ungodly source of our anger. In other words, be sure what you are being angry about. If it is out of ignorance or your arrogance or fear or pain or the like, purge it from your heart and mind before you speak to one another. Again, it isn't easy, but it is much more effective in doing the work of our Lord Jesus in this world in which we live. I'm reminded again of the words of St. Francis of Assisi who said famously, Preach Christ! And if necessary, use words. It's a cute saying that brings a smile to our face when we hear it. And yet, is it any different than so many other sayings we are just as quick to ignore, like actions speak louder than words, or talk is cheap? They're there, we know them, and we immediately set them all aside. It is easy to say that we believe in Jesus and that we believe in following Jesus Christ. But friends, if our actions give no evidence of that belief, then either we are lying or we have deceived ourselves as to what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. This isn't so much about hypocrisy, friends, as it is about failing to act out the laws of love and mercy and generosity to which Scripture speaks again and again and again, to which Christ has called us, to which God has called us. We can say that we love our neighbors, but if there is no action of loving them, then it has no meaning. Actions add value to our words. The hypocrisy is readily visible if we say one thing and do another. 
But I, friends, I think the real damage to the gospel comes in professing to love one another and then pretending others don't exist. Call it mission, call it outreach, call it random acts of kindness, if you will, or whatever you want to call it. But friends, you cannot profess a faith in Jesus Christ and do nothing to care for others in need. For James, if you are truly hearing the word of God, then it must lead to godly, Christ-like action. Again, because you believe in Jesus and have heard his commandments, then you must take action upon them, not just sit and say, aren't those wonderful thoughts? You must be, as he says in verse 22, doers of the word. Yes, there will always be more need than we could ever hope to deal with. And there will always be needs that are beyond our own ability to relieve. But friends, we must always be careful not to use that as a rationale or an excuse to throw up our hands and do nothing. What James is asking of us is beyond difficult. And we must be honest that there are only a few among us that get close to upholding those principles of faith. And I readily admit that you're not looking at one right now. But this does not release us from every day striving to live and be doers of our faith as James outlines it here, as Christ has commanded it, as God has instructed it. As we strive to do so, though, it might benefit us to remember what the baptism that we will perform later today means, and that the actions of Jesus are at its heart. It should remind us of Jesus' own baptism, which started him down in his earnest road toward that difficult path of love that led him to the cross where the stain of this world can be washed away from us. Friends, if you believe in that good news, the good news in which we baptize, the good news which we will celebrate next week as we come to the table and celebrate the Lord's Supper together, if you believe in that good news, then friends, you must go show it to others by your actions and not just your words. And what we have, each one of us, said here today is given meaning and value beyond compare. I can say it no better than James himself. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Amen.